Hello and welcome again to this particular session. So starting today, the MCQ series on accounting standard, just to test actually how well we have prepared so far. Let's begin straight away now with question number one, which basically states that oh, with which AS2 relates to. Quite obviously, very simple answer. Each one of us is well aware of it that it relates to valuation of inventories. Coming down to question number two, it states that consistency with reference to the application of accounting policies principle refers to. So whenever we use the word consistency, it means whatever accounting methods and procedures which we have adopted in the current year, we must keep on actually adopting same accounting policies and methods on year to year basis. So this will become your correct answer accounting method and procedures which you need to use consistently from year to year basis. Question number three deals with accounting standard and not override the statute. Each one of us are well aware of this particular fact that if there is a clash with respect to a particular item as far as treatment from the angle of the law and from the perspective of accounting standard is concerned in that particular case, law will prevail, statute will prevail. So that is why accounting standard cannot override the statute. Global key professional accounting body is known as in India. We know that accounting standard board is the key body, key accounting body, and it happens to be a constitutionary body of ICA, uh, ICAI. Whereas uh, internationally, so global key professional body is International Accounting Standard Board. This should be your answer, Accounting Standard Board. Question number five: Original cost at which an asset or liability is acquired is known as historical cost. It's a pretty easy answer in which you should be aware of. Question number six says that as per AS 11, the process of converting foreign subsidiary financial statement into the home currency is known as, suppose the parent company is situated in India, correct? So the reporting currency in this particular case will be rupee. While our subsidiary is situated outside India, it might have prepared its financials in the foreign currency, say USA, USA dollar. So in order to consolidate, first of all, what we will have to do, we will have to actually translate their financial statement into the reporting currency. So this process is known as translation. Question number seven states that as per AS21, the accounting process in which financial statement of a parent company and subsidiary companies are added together to yield a unified or combined financial statement, of course, is known as consolidation. So many times we have done it now. Question number eight deals with how many standards actually ICAI have so far issued. Each one of you as a professional student should be aware of this particular fact that till up to this particular point of time, ICAI has issued 32 accounting standard without an iota of doubt. However, at the same time, you need to be careful that out of this 32 accounting standard, accounting standard 8 have been deleted. It was related with research and development. And some years back, even accounting standard 6 is deleted. Actually, it is not exactly deleted. Rather, it is submerged into accounting standard AS10. So, and besides that, there are three standards which deal with financial instruments 30, 31, 32. These standards were issued way back, quite a long time back. But even till up to this particular time, these three standards have never been notified. So, unless a particular standard is notified, entities or any form of organization need not require to adopt it. So, effectively, we may say 32 minus 5, 27 accounting standards right now at this particular moment are effectively issued and notified, we may say so. However, the question in this case is asking you how many accounting standards have been issued. So, accounting standards basically issued are 30, uh, sorry, 32 in this case, your answer should be, but they have given 31, 32 and 31. So, we will have to mark out this particular alternative, correct? However, effectively, there are 27 accounting standard. It goes without saying. Which section of the Companies Act? Next question is related to which section of the Companies Act 2013 actually prescribes the fact that every company shall comply with the accounting standard. Now, as far as Companies Act 2013 is concerned, 
section 129 section 129 provides that financial statement of every company should comply with the accounting standard provided your company is not falling within the parameters of NDAs. See, remember one thing, existing standards are followed by non-corporate bodies and such companies which are still not within the vicinity of NDAs. Uh, NDAs. Then section 133 of Companies Act 2013 it states that the financial statement of every company shall comply with NDAs provided that company is falling within the vicinity of NDAs or satisfying the various criteria of NDAs. Correct? So your answer in this particular case will be section 129 because it is related to accounting standards. Question number 10 actually states that in the case of charitable trust and cooperative society, if their activities are purely charitable purely means 100 percent charitable and 100 percent non-commercial then accounting standards are not applicable yes it is absolutely correct logically accounting standard need to be followed by every type of entity every form of business whether you happens to be a charitable organization whether you happen to be an ngo whether you happen to be a not-for-profit organization or a sole proprietorship business or a partnership business or a company form of business Irrespective of the form of business, if your activities are commercial, then you have to follow NDAs. Unless and until you have 100% non-commercial activity, even if 1% activity of yours is commercial, then you will have to follow the what we call accounting standard. So part 1 is absolutely correct. It says that 100% of the activities are non-commercial or purely charitable. Then point number B states that even if a very small proportion of the activities of trust and cooperatives are considered to be commercial, industrial or business in nature, then accounting standards are applicable. Yes, it is also correct. correct. So in this case, both these statements are correct. Question number 11 says that which of the following is level 1 enterprise? Now let me tell you, a level 1 enterprise now as per the latest guidelines issued now a level one enterprise is one which which is a listed company if you are a listed company then you will be termed as level one enterprises level one enterprise whether you are listed or about to be listed about to be listed so if you are a listed company or about to be listed company then automatically you are level one enterprise or if you, you are engaged in banking activities or you are engaged in insurance activities, even in that case, you will automatically become a level 1 enterprise. Or if you are turned over, if you are turned over excluding other income, excluding other income, if your turnover exceeds 250 crores, this is the amendment brought in, correct? So, in Companies Amendment Accounting Standard Rule, now there are four types of enterprises instead of three. Level 1 enterprise, I have already told you if you happen to be a listed company or if you happen to be a banking company or if you are a company and your turnover exceeds 250 crores or if your borrowings, including public deposits, if your borrowings are more than 50 crores, in that case, you can be classified as level one enterprise if we will go through all these four statements we'll find that none of these statement is satisfying the criteria now so that is the reason your answer will be none of the above which of the following is level two enterprise a level two enterprise nowadays as per the what we call change rules as per the change rule is one Whose turn? See, first point is given listed enterprise outside India. That means it is a level one enterprise. Correct? It cannot be level two enterprise. All commercial industrial business reporting enterprise whose turnover immediately preceding the accounting period exceeds 50 crores. Exceeds 50 crores. Actually, if it exceeds 250 crores, then you will become level one enterprise. But if it is in between exceeds 50 crores 
and up to 250 crores then you are a level 2 enterprise so you can be level 2 enterprise only if your turnover is more than 50 crores but up to 250 crores is it clear to you if you are a financial institution because all financial institution banking companies they are considered as level 1 enterprise then you will be considered as level 1 enterprise enterprise carrying on insurance business will be considered as level 1 enterprise so in this case because your turnover is exceeding 50 crore but it is not clearly mentioned whether it is less than 250 crore or not we presume that it is up to 250 crores then you will be considered as level 2 enterprise don't go by the answers in this case because some changes have taken place that is why i am telling you your answer in this case will become two on the pre presumption that your turnover is actually exceeding 50 crores but up to 250 crores which aspect of financial instrument is dealt by as 31 Actually, this is a relevant question because AS30, 31 and 32 have never been notified and to be very honest with you, shall never ever be notified. Correct? Because only NDS will prevail. NDS 109, 32 and 107 deal with financial instruments. So, logically, all these standards are uh, need not require to be notified and will never be notified. However, just to answer the same AS31 deals with, as I just told you earlier, a move into ago with presentational aspect of the financial instruments. Which of the following are fundamental accounting assumptions? Under AS1, we have studied that going concern, there are three fundamental assumptions. One is going concern and second is consistency and third one is accrual. So, your answer will be A, C and F. Yes, answer A, C and F is given in this question. Again, question number 15 says that which of the following is non-SMC? I have already told you now, nowadays, as far as for the application of the accounting standards, for the application of the accounting standards, we classify enterprises first of all into two types, non-corporate bodies, non-corporate bodies, and corporate bodies and corporate bodies this classification is given by icai and this classification you can indirectly say is given by mca ministry of corporate affairs correct non corporate bodies as i just told you a moment ago now at present because you have studied that these are classified into three categories. But now it is level 1 enterprise, level 2 enterprise, level 3 enterprise. And a fourth category is also inserted that is known as micro level enterprises. Correct? Large enterprises, medium scale enterprises, small scale enterprises and micro level enterprises. This is the new category as far as non-corporate bodies are concerned. Now, as far as corporate bodies are concerned, Ministry of Corporate Affairs have classified all the companies into two categories, SMC, small and medium companies and non-SMC. Non-SMC means which are not small and medium companies, it means they are big companies, large scale companies. Now, question is asking which of the following is non-SMC company? whose equity or debt securities are not listed and are not in the process of listing that is correct that is correct which is not a bank that is also correct in fact all these characteristics must be satisfied if if you can be categorized as smc if you in, if you intend yourself to get categorized as smc whose turnover excluding other income does not exceed 250 crore i made it 250 crores correct so, if you are neither a listed company nor about to be a listed company, all these characteristics in case of SMC and non-SMC, all the characteristics must be satisfied. If you are neither a listed company nor about to be a listed company, if you are not a bank, financial institution or insurance company, and if your turnover is not exceeding 250 crores, then in this particular case, you will be categorized as non-SMC 
uh, as non smc company if all these three category categories if all these three characteristics are satisfied then you will be categorized as smc sorry then you will be categorized as smc company is it clear to you actually there is one more not only one in fact all the characteristics actually this answer is not correctly given correct so all the characteristics must be satisfied if you can be termed as smc if any of the characteristic is violated then in that case you will become a big company that means suppose if you are a listed company then automatically you will be considered as sms non smc company if you are a bank financial institution or insurance company then again you will be categorized as smc if your turnover will exceed 250 crores then you will be categorized as non smc company so if all these these if all these three characteristic will be satisfied then only you will become what we call smc is it clear to you however there should be one more the fourth characteristic is that your borrowings your borrowings should not be more than 50 crores should not exceed 50 crores correct so if you are able to satisfy all these four characteristics then you will be labeled or tagged as smc now question number 16 in the light of changed amendment have become redundant so please don't attempt this question because i have already told you some recent amendments have taken place so that is why this question cannot be attempted in the light of that attempt that question number 17 actually deals with as per company's accounting standard rule an existing company which was previously non smc company and subsequently becomes smc company shall not be qualified for exemption or relaxation in respect of accounting standards available to an smc try to understand this thing if you happen to be a non smc company i have already told you non smc company means you are a big company generally big companies or non smc companies have to follow almost all the accounting standards number one and there is no partial exemption is also available to them question states that earlier you were a non smc company now you have become smc now you have become smc it is possible due to some or other reason or because of low business performance now you have become a non smc company because an SMC company is entitled to not only exemptions from some accounting standard, but also partial exemption. That means an, an SMC is given some exemptions with respect to some accounting standards. And at the same time, some paragraphs of some accounting standard. When you need not require to follow an accounting standard, we say that you are allowed full exemption correct and partial exemption means a standard is applicable but some paragraph need not be followed by you now in this case question is telling earlier you were a non smc company now you have become an smc company so is it possible now that you can avail the exemptions which are available to an smc company the answer will be no at least for next two years you will have to follow all the accounting standard even though you have become an SMC. So if you get yourself converted, or in fact, if you get converted from non-SMC, from big company to SMC, that is small and medium company, even in that case, directly, you cannot claim the exemptions at least for the next two years. So your answers will be uh, two consecutive accounting years in this particular case, two consecutive accounting periods, correct? Question number 18 deals with AS20 deals with, of course, I need to require to tell you earning per share where you used to study EPS and of course, DE debts, we call it diluted earning per share. Then in this case, in this case, question number 19, just wait, actually mouse has started playing tricks. 
which of the following is treated as potential equity share as per AS20? I just mentioned diluted earning per share. You have seen actually there are some shares which have the potential to get converted into some uh, into equity shares. For example, convertible debentures, they are potential because the moment they will get converted into equity shares, share warrants, employee stock options, so all of the above known as potential equity shares. Is it clear to you or not? Question number 20. If rights and beneficial interest in property are transferred, suppose I sell you a property and I have transferred the rights and beneficial interest to you. If rights and beneficial interest in property are transferred but documentation and legal formalities are pending, then seller and purchaser should record in their accounts as sale and purchase. Even though some legal formalities are pending but we have already recorded that I have sold the building and you have recorded as a purchase. So question is asking, this is example of what? Is it example of prudence? No, because prudence means wisdom. Think before you leave. So here nothing is like that. In fact, it is an example of substance over form because legally I am not the owner of that building because some legal formalities are still pending. So legally, I'm not still the owner of that building. I have purchased the building from you, let's say, but I have recorded it as my building now, correct? So legally, I'm not entitled to that, but in substance, in reality, because I have got the right of, over that particular building. So that's the reason actually I have recorded it. So it is a case of substance over form, correct? Actually, it is over form, written from, anyway, over form, F-O-R-M. 21. Which of the following is included in the cost of inventory as per AS2? Correct. Duties and taxes. Duties and taxes subsequently recoverable are generally not included. Rebates are not included. In fact, they are subtracted. Duty drawbacks are subtracted. So, freight inwards are recorded. Your answer should be freight inwards. Question number 22 says that payment of penalties, fines for violation of law should be disclosed separately. It should not be clubbed with office expenses or miscellaneous expenses. This is example of what? Is it example of prudence, substance over form or materiality or realization? In fact, it is a case of materiality because if we have paid penalties or fine and presuming that amount is quite high, then it becomes a material item. It need to be reflected as a separate line item. It should not be clubbed with miscellaneous expenses. So that is the point is. Question number 23 states that as per AS3, unrealized gain and losses arising from changes in foreign exchange rates you must have studied AS3 in your earlier phases of education, but how well you have gone through, because generally you try to attempt only questions, hardly go through the theories. So any unrealized gain actually which arises because of translation of foreign item or changes in foreign exchange rate, you may say so. So generally unrealized gains are not considered as cash flows. So, not cash flows should be your answer. In fact, just to enhance your knowledge, such items are used for reconciliation purposes. 24. Provision for doubtful debts, provision for discount and debtors are based on. When we actually try to understand, I have sold some goods to you for rupees 5 lakh. Correct. And let us say you are going to give the amount to me in the next year. But when I will reach the end of current accounting year, why I would make a provision for doubtful debts or why I would make a provision for discount? That means I will apply my wisdom. I will apply my think thinking uh, prowess. And because it could be a possibility that I might be having a hunch that that particular uh, customer might not be able to pay some portion of the debts or it could be a possibility that in order to lure that particular person to pay the amount much before the stipulated date, I may give him some discount. 
So that is a case of prudence. Correct? As you know the meaning of prudence. Prudence basically means all the expected losses must be provided for. Correct? So that is the reason. All the losses, expected losses must be provided for because provision for doubtful debts or provision for discount which you are making in the current accounting year. These losses haven't yet taken place. Remember one thing. So that is the reason these are expected sort of losses. 25. Which of the following is required to be disclosed as per AS1? AS1 clearly, which, which is related to disclosure, clearly states that all the significant policies must be disclosed, fundamental accounting exemptions must be disclosed and if there is any change in accounting policies, then it must be disclosed. So all of the above should be your answer. Question number 26 stated as per AS2 inventory should be valued. As per AS2 your inventory must be valued at cost or net realizable value. So your answer will be at lower of cost or net realizable value. We are well aware of this. Then as per AS2 the historical cost of inventory should normally be determined by because AS2 clearly states that historical cost should be determined by applying FIFO method or weighted average cost of method. So this should be your answer. Question number 28 states that as per AS3 an investment normally qualifies as cash equivalent only when it has a short term maturity. There are two important items under AS3. One is cash. What do you mean by cash? Cash basically means cash in hand. And demand deposits. And demand deposits. For example, I have deposited some money in my bank. At any point of time, I can take it out and I can take it back. So that is a demand dep deposit. So that is cash. Now cash equivalent. Cash equivalent. Generally, any investment, if we have made some investment somewhere, and maturity period is less than 90 days, maturity period is less than 90 days, then such investments are treated as cash equivalent. So, in this case, three months or less should be your answer. Question number 29 states that, NRV or net realizable value of inventory is the expected selling price. We have seen the meaning of NRV. What is NRV? Net realizable value. That is selling price less expenses which you are going to incur. That is expected selling expenses to make the sale complete. So NRV or net realizable value of inventory basically means selling price or market price less expenses necessary to complete the sale. Question number 30 states that depreciation applies to goodwill and other intangible assets. Logically one may tempt to say yes. Correct? But generally we use the term amortization, forest plantation and similar regenerative activities. No, depreciation doesn't apply to A, doesn't apply to B, wasting assets. No, property, plant and equipment. Yes, depreciation applies to property, plant and equipments. 31. Due to which of the following concept inventory is valued at cost or net realizable value? Now this is very interesting answer. Suppose your inventory cost is 5 lakh and your net realizable value is 6 lakh. Then you will prepare your financials for the current year at what value you are going to write the stock. We each one of us know 
that generally lower value. So lower value is 5 lakh. Even though net realizable value is higher, we are still going to record it at 5 lakh. The reason being is that concept of prudence states that we need to take into account all the expected losses but at the same time we need to ignore all the expected gains because this is not real sale still it is just expected so we cannot treat what we call 6 lakh if we are going to write here 6 lakh our profit will get exaggerated by 1 lakh so that's the reason actually we have to say in this case prudence such questions are important Question number 32 states that AS7 construction contracts should be applied in accounting for construction contracts in the financial statements of AS7 construction contracts. Now you tell me the answer. Who will do the accounting for construction contracts? Contractee or contractor? So contractors, so contractors because they have taken the contract, they have spent the amount, they are going to receive the money, contract price, they are going to do the accounting. Question number 33 states that while finalizing the current year's profit, company realized that there was an error in the valuation of closing stock of the previous year. That means in the last year when we prepared the financials, correct? So when we recorded the closing stock, there was some error. While finalizing the current year's profit, the company realized that there was an error in the valuation of closing stock in the previous year and in the previous year, the closing stock was overvalued. Let us say it is overvalued by 10 lakh. So what will happen? That means last year's profit is more by rupees 10 lakh. And same item, same item in the current year, we will write as an opening stock because it is already overvalued by 10 lakh. Now this will be written towards the debit side. So what will happen? Our current year's profit get understated while previous year's profit will get overstated. So your answer will be previous year's profit because of this mistake. Previous year profit will be overstated and current year's profit will be understated. Question, question number 34. As per AS7, construction contracts and expected loss on the construction cost contract should be. We have, we have seen it so many times now that when we take the contract and if we estimate that by the time we would complete the contract, we will incur a loss, then standard says that entire loss should be charged. So, your answer should be recognized as an expense immediately. That means it is debited to profit a loss account. Entire amount of loss will be debited. Which of the following method of inventory valuation is not recommended by AS2? So, let's see. A specific identi identification method is uh, allowed. Last in first method is not allowed, weighted is allowed, first in first method is allowed. So your answer in this case will be last in first out. Which of the following is not a method of determining the stage of completion of a contract as per AS7? As per AS7, which one is not a method? See, even physical completion method is considered as a method to know the stage of completion. Surveys of work performed is also allowed, but there is no method by the name of residual completion method. So this should be your answer. Question number 37 is similar to the one which we just did a moment ago. Closing stock is overstated. So what will happen when closing stock will overstate it, the profits will also increase and inventory will also increase. Question is simply asking this much. So both profit and current asset will increase. Question number 38. AS9 is concerned with the recognition of revenue arising in the course of the ordinary activities of the enterprise from sale of goods, yes, from sale of, from rendering of services 
and of course from use of others by enterprise resources which yield actually interest royalty and dividend so your answer will be all of the above question number 39 which of the following is revenue as per as9 now in this case realized gain from disposal of non current asset are not covered by as9 natural increase in herds and agriculture and forest product there is separate standard although under existing standard there is still not a single standard dealing with agriculture correct realized or unrealized gain resulting from changes in foreign exchange rate that is also not covered by what we call as9 so your answer will be none of the ever none of the ever so till up to 39 we have done and rest of the question i will pick up in the upcoming session correct so in the upcoming session we'll finish up this series and after that after that what i am going to do till the examination I will do some important guess questions, which in my opinion will hold you good in a very good state. In fact, will hold you in a very good state. So uh, that is what I would do once I will finish up with all the all these things. So okay, and it's time to say goodbye. I'm a bit tired today, also no doubt about that. There are lots of classes I had to take, as you know. So on such note, we finish up today's this particular session with the promise as usual to meet you again next time at eight thirty. Till then, it's goodbye.